Hello, this is Canyon Podcast Preacher. Welcome back to my podcast, Deep Waters. This podcast is brought to you by Applied Strengths Ministry, where we believe working together in our strengths is the effect of working out the will and calling of God in and through our lives. The title of this message is, How to Read Your Cookbook. (laughs) No, this is not about reading a cookbook, but about as you read your Bible, you will be cooking for God. It's kind of like the turkey cooking itself. Well, but the source of the fire is the Holy Spirit. And so, but to be on fire, you will have to contain the source. Therefore, you will need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Matthew 3.11 I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Psalms 104.4 Who makes his angels spirits, his ministers a flame of fire. And but the inverse is also true. Second Chronicles 15.2 and he went out to meet Azza and said to him, Hear me, Azza, and all Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you while you are with him. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. You see, we cannot obey him and we cannot know him if we do not read about him. Second Thessalonians 1, 7, 8. No, I don't just mean to read the Bible, but to actually desire to get to know how he thinks, loves, serves, behaves, under the most tensest of situations. Read to seek him and you will find him, and then you can discover what it is to find God. Jeremy twenty nine thirteen and Isaiah fifty five six. Do so to eventually, when you are prepared as a spiritually mature disciple, to do the things that he did while he was on this planet. John fourteen twelve. We cannot be in Christ reproducing nothing in our lives as it relates to Christianity. Romans six eleven and twenty three. Being and existing in Christ will mean that we reproduce the things that Jesus reproduced when he was here, Acts 17, 28. And so, but I want to show you a biblical clock that will eventually stop ticking for the Gentiles. Well, it will stop after the Gentiles' bride is taken up, as Israel needs to be saved next. And we have some 144,000 Jews to add, and more, of course. And but when this work is finished, it stops for all of humanity for eternity. No doubt the watch industry will crash. Listen and see if you can hear it. Isaiah 55, 6. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. It is one word, while. Yes, that word tells us we only have a bit of time to decide if we will accept the gospel and saving salvationary life of Jesus, a deal that only he can offer. Eventually, like he is lost to the Jews today for a minute, he will be lost to the Gentiles then. Sooner rather than later, he will not be able to be found. Sooner rather than later, he will not be near. I just wanted to nudge you off of that sin-laden couch and get you to be a little more uncomfortable regarding your position to and in him. Salvation for the Gentiles has an expiration date. It is best if you accept it now. Romans 11.25 For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion. That blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Luke 21, 24, and they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Ticky tock, tick tock. So in terms of the Bible world, numbers mean stuff. I mean, like precisely and pretty much all of everything can be calculated by numbers other than how old God is. Oh, I know we have the infinity symbol, but of that, Google AI shares the following. The infinity symbol is not a number, but rather a concept or idea that represents something larger than any number. Definition. Infinity is the idea of something without limits, or having no time, space, or other quantity limits. Symbol. The infinity symbol was invented by English mathematician John Wallace in 1657. Usage. Infinity is often used in math to count or measure things, and can be used in mathematical operations, like defining a limit or taking an integral. Examples. The number line has arrows at the end to represent the idea of having no bounds. History. Ancient cultures had various ideas about infinity, and the Greeks and ancient Indians approached it as a philosophical concept. Aristotle distinguished between potential infinity and actual infinity, which he considered impossible. So, for those of you a little like me, when we see that the infinity symbol is really a number eight that fell asleep, You can say, well, if we keep going in this direction, I too am going to fall asleep. (laughs) Yes, but numbers do have meanings. That's what I'm really trying to say. I have read Steve Siakalani's book titled, 
The Divine Code, Volume 1 and 2, which is a very comprehensive study of the biblical meaning to various numbers from and through number 1 to 1,000. So, but because his definitions are significantly more comprehensive than I need in this message, in order to make my point, I just looked up the meaning of some numbers that I do remember from Google. Okay, so while there's a cross-contamination of meanings, as many of the meanings are mixed with occultism and numerology and horoscopathy. And yes, I made up that word. So basically, in their simplest meanings, three means perfection, 10 means authority, seven means completion, and 12 means government. Now, if you want a much deeper understanding, or you want to get into the prophetic meaning of the numbers, then read Stephen C.'s two books. You will not regret it. Now, talk about setting up 55 cones when one may have done the job. I am using the number seven as representing seven points on how to read your Bible because of its meaning. Of course, there are possibly hundreds of ways to read your Bible. Mine is by using adult color crayons, highlighters, and sparkly pens, so much so until the Bible falls apart and it becomes unreadable. Now, but I do sometimes also consider these steps because we all learn differently. I learn by visual and by touching, which is why I don't study too much by reading the Bible on the computer. Yes, I do use it for my messages as it saves me typing time. Can you imagine typing out 50 to 100 scriptures in a message? (laughs) I know, don't say it. Hey, Mr. Podcast Preacher, why do you got to include half the Bible in each message anyways? (laughs) I told you not to say it. No, but for real. I don't want you to think that I make things up and grab ideas out of thin air. And so just to say and stay on the straight and narrow, the scriptures that I feel led to include are actually the most beautiful things of the entire message. Oh, I know I can cut a riff, thanks be to God and all, but if you removed all of what I said and just left and then read and applied only the scripture portion of those messages, you would be blessed and have just as much of a chance of receiving revelation that I get when I type them out. Okay, so I thought I would just take a minute to talk to you. And yes, I did, and will continue to do so. So we have set before us the magic seven steps that I have accumulated over the years to aid in reading the Bible. I will pretend that you are first-time Bible readers and that this message is your first time attending my life group. (laughs) And no, not physically. And don't leave your church on my account. By the way, can someone pick up 50,000 bagels and a barrel full of coffee for this Sunday service? Yes, I actually wish that I could have to make such a request one day. Can you imagine 50,000 us's sold completely out to him, Firebrand, doing his work? Okay, so you just bought a Bible and are wondering where you should start. Now, my recommendations and this message is assuming that you will go cover to cover in your book at least the first time through. Consider some of my previous messages where I mentioned that we don't have very long to wait until Jesus comes and shouts his Gentile bride up, up and away. There exists a time when someone may start to read their Bible and will not have enough time to go cover to cover before the trumpet sounds. It would be like trying to bake cookies without reading all the recipe. Is it a requirement to get saved? Nope. But if you can get to know Jesus, that is God, and obey his commands without fully knowing what they are, you should might make that your preach from today moving forward. 2 Thessalonians 1, 7, 8. So in my life group, I challenged some of my guys to read through the Bible within a year after finding out that quite a few had professed Christianity for over 20 years and had only depended mostly on what was verbalized from the pulpit of the church that they were attending to feed them in order that they be effective Christians. Oh, the dry milk in these days. I would have thought that they would have tired of that powdery stuff and desired the pure milk of the word. 1 Peter 2, 1, 3. Yes, I am talking about what was even preached out of our own church. I will say this and move on. If you are not attending a church that is equipping you for ministry, making you a disciple, and when ready, releasing you to make disciples, and, well, also releasing any and all of everybody, when they are ready, into ministry, then leave it. Of course, if they are willing to change, then you stay and help them to do so. But if not, you are not obligated to remain in its deadness. You can read The Revelation of the Seven Seals, written by William Brannan, to go much deeper into the condition of our churches today. Most churches, not all, to gain the understanding and urgency for you to run on fire with everything in you. If they have a fire extinguisher by the front door, leave. (laughs) But yes, it is your responsibility to be ready to meet Jesus, fully having run your race. Your denomination will not be representing you in heaven. If you are a leader of any kind in the church or a teacher, then you should make it a priority to send this message to all of your sheep peeps. Yes, I'm helping you out. You don't have to come up with the message, see? But you can make it your own as long as you leave any revelatory portions intact. So, after my heart stopped crying, after I had heard that they hadn't even gone cover to cover, 
I asked them to make reading the Bible a priority for the next 12 months, and that I would also join them in this task. Now, the point wasn't to study the Bible, but to simply go cover to cover. Habits are started one consistent step at a time. But so because I was the leader of this men's group, I wanted to set the example. During the season, I was working 50 hours a week as an office manager. I say this so that you know you were never really off work in that position. I was also in full-time ministry, working most of the days on Sundays as a church administrator, well, seven days a week, as I was doing quite a bit of other things as well. I also had other groups, such as couples groups and pre-marriage groups with my wife's help, of course. Yes, I took on too much in that season, but at that time, I did not know how to manage my life. I thought and believed with everything in me that this was the path to be on for revival to break out starting in Chico, California. Oh, I wanted another Welsh or Azusa revival event, knowing and believing that, considering the lack of miracle signs and wonders, the lack of effort or even capability for the church to equip the saints for the work of ministry, that a revival was the only thing that could turn us around. I still hope for it today, but I am more focused in just teaching the things of God, and if it comes, it no doubt will be the best of all times that we have ever had in a church. We'll just have to keep our hands off of the work of God when he is moving in those greatest of measures. So, but anyway, I decided to see if I really focused on the task at hand, just how many times I could read the Bible in that 12-month period. Yep, if you listen to my message title, More Than a Conqueror, you will understand why I set that as a goal. So the results were that I did read the Bible in a year. Well, one time in a month, reading the New Testament in a single day at a local Starbucks. One time in three months. And the other two times the remaining portion of the year. So four times in one year. And if I wasn't so busy, it could and should have been more. (laughs) Now you might say, hey, Mr. Podcast Preacher, you sure are full of yourself. Ah, but no. John Sung, after he became authentically born again, was tossed into an insane asylum because they thought he was crazy. So his response was to read the Bible cover to cover 40 times in six months. And well, when he got out, he threw away all of his past life, returned back home, and started a revival. And well, who hasn't heard how George Mueller, who ultimately started and managed three orphanages, whereby they lived hand to hand in faith and watched God provide in spite of no, zero, not our resources. Yep, he read the Bible over 200 times. I know, I know. Some might say, but we have cell phones, tablets, computers, and TVs. We don't have much time. And after we partake of these things, we don't have the time to read the Bible at all. Hey, I'm on the waste time and TV land list with you. Oh, if I could right now do it all over again, I wouldn't. (laughs) I got you. Look, we pick up right where we are at and pray that God will show you your days. Psalms 39, 4, Lord, make me to know my end, and what is the measure of my days, that I may know how frail I am. If you get this message and you are in prison, I would make it my life's mission to read the Bible a thousand times. This is the only way to burn a prison down, or should I say up? So, but in this ministry, it is one of my primary motivators to encourage you to get into the book and cook. I believe the day is soon approaching when our access will be removed and that just owning a Bible can get you a date with the head-removing sword, metaphorically speaking, of course. Right now, no one can remove my Bible from me, even if they did break into my house, and I caution against this, (laughs) but that if they did, my Bible would remain safe. I have never heard of one being stolen or even being reported stolen. But now on the other end, as all books become digitized, Making it illegal to own a Bible is as simple as removing access for anyone to purchase one. Yep, Google and Amazon are working at an unfathomable rate of speed to digitize our books written prior to computers. Now, before I get into my seven points about how to read your Bible and the four points about what to look for when reading it, I should but address the revelation in the room. You can listen to my message titled, Interpretation is the Enemy of Spiritual Intelligence, for a more completer understanding of what I'm sharing here. Look, I carry around a wooden mallet, which is used for those in whom I come in contact with who say or respond to my comments, questions, scriptural references, or even the totality of a message with, hey, Mr. Podcast Preacher Man, that is not my interpretation. To be honest, that is still difficult to write. Yes, that word interpretation. And but see, I don't actually carry a wooden mallet as it wouldn't be interpreted correctly. (laughs) But the Bible is not to read with the mind or attitude of interpretation. Look, let's just decom that word so that we can put it to rest before we get out of bed on this message. Interpretation, the act of interpreting, elucidation, explication. This writer's work demands interpretation. 
an explanation of the meaning of another artistic or creative work, an elucidation, an interpretation of a poem, a conception of another's behavior, a charitable interpretation of his tactlessness, a way of interpreting, the rendering of a dramatic part, music, etc., so as to bring out the meaning or to indicate one's particular conception of it. Ah, you already know I need to go deeper. Interpret, to give or provide the meaning of, explain, explicit, explicate, elucidate, to interpret the hidden meaning of a parable. Pay attention to that, to interpret the hidden meaning of a parable, to construe or understand in a particular way, to interpret a reply as favorable, to bring out the meaning of a dramatic work, music, etc., by performance or execution, to perform or render according to one's own understanding or sensitivity. You see how that closes off everybody else's input to just your own, according to one's own understanding. Okay, and well, we got to go deeper. Elucidate, to make lucid or clear, throw a light upon, explain. An explanation that elucidated his recent strange behavior. And well, no use stopping now. Revelation, the act of revealing or disclosing. Disclosure, the revelation of previously hidden facts about the group's activities Change the situation completely. Exposure, divulgence, admission, something revealed or disclosed, especially a striking disclosure, such as of something not before realized. Now, theology. In other words, this is the theological definition of revelation. God's disclosure of himself and his will to his creatures. I would add to his creation, including us creatures, because we are his feature creatures. (laughs) But no, also, did you hear that? God's disclosure of himself. And isn't the Bible a big fat love letter from God describing himself and all of everything? Yes. So wouldn't it be prudent that the author of such works would be the bestest option for reading and seeking understanding of its contents? Yes, again. This is me still. I do not want to know your interpretation or, in many more cases, your ignorant understanding of what's in between the covers of such a holy book. I truly am not trying to be rude. But clearly the obvious is, well, not so obvious to many. I just prayed for you, and I hope you have the ears to hear my sincerity and my heart on this small but hugely significant Christianity point. Okay, continuing on with the rest of the definition. An instance of such communication or disclosure. Something thus communicated or disclosed. Something that contains such disclosure as the Bible. Okay, one more definition. Disclosure. The act or instance of disclosing, exposure, revelation. That which is disclosed, a revelation. Okay, so now that we have fed the elephant and have traveled full circle and thoroughly explained why we do not seek to understand the Bible by interpretation, but by getting the revelation of it, we can move on. Oh, but yes, I hear you saying, hey, podcast preacher, where is the scriptural support for that claim? I would say, good on you, and here you go. Galatians 1, 10, 12. For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I still please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man, for I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it. But it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. What? Is this how Paul was to be the author of 13 or 14 Bible books and epistles or letters? Depending on what interpretation you get, I guess. (laughs) <laughs> now, some say he wrote Hebrews, which, if he did, would give him 14. But others say it was a ghostwriter. <laughs> That's twice. Holy Ghost, get it? Second Timothy three sixteen seventeen. Well, anyway, he was loaded with something, as even Peter stated, that some of Paul's writings were difficult to understand. Second Peter three sixteen, As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of the scripture. Now, basically, this is a warning. This is why you need to read the Bible over and over and over and over and over again. You don't want to twist the scriptures to your own destruction. You want to make sure that you're getting a revelation of them, and you will need other people's help to do that. So how do they twist? Interpretation and, well, out and out lying. And but before moving on, Do not say, hey, podcast preacher, man, it states that Paul didn't have to get taught the gospel, so I don't have to learn it either. Well, Paul was not being taught for 14 years. Galatians 2, 1. And I suppose that you would not want the same demon or a thorn in your side that he had. You know, just so you didn't have to read your Bible. 
something that wasn't readily available for him to read because, well, he had most of it in his head. Second Corinthians 12, 7. And least I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan, to buffet me, least I be exalted above measure. You notice it doesn't say by the abundance of interpretations. Yeah. Well, since he wrote way more than what was included in the Bible, I guess you could say he had it more in him than we do even today with all of our seminaries and stuff. Let's hear it again. Ephesians 3, 2, 5. If indeed you have heard of the dispensation of grace of God, which was given to me for you, how that by revelation, he, that is God, made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. By how? By revelation. By who? It has now been revealed by the Spirit. Oh, but preacher man, it states to whom this happened. I know, I always seem to have to go the distance on these things. Maybe this is why these messages don't make it to a pulpit that is under specific time frames. No commercial breaks or monetizing interruptions here. Take heed, you worshiping artists that monetize your worship and consider that if you are, in fact, called to be a worshiper and have the ability to lead anyone into the presence of God and you cut up the presence for a nickel, well, you get what you got. I will simply leave that for now as it requires more scriptures and more explanation. Trust me when I say that you need to know God by revelation or else. Much love. John fourteen twenty six. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. It is a helper who instructs you in all things God. Yes, he hears and speaks. Our role is to hear him and do. So when you are reading, seek his voice and instruction, as well as a revelation of what he is saying or asking you to do. The last nug is that you keep in mind that one scripture may have a variation or variety of revelation within it. Yes, sometimes it's just logical such as a log in your eye story. It is easy to get that story as written, but then the revelation of it can take you beyond just a log story. So for example, when you are sure you have no more logs, ought not you be helping others to deal with theirs? And what of the splinter haters? Yes, since both are also eye irritants, affecting also the heart in conviction, that is conviction of sin, it also, that is a log story, if deeper understood, really presents the bearer of the log to get right, so that they can have a testimony that will help those who still may have splinters. The revelation of this is also that the loggers can be considered new believers who recently got saved or those who are just not spiritually maturing very fast. The splinter peeps can represent those who are more spiritually mature and who have learned to deal in a mature way with the irritation of the splinters, the sins that they may still be working on. And but as you read the story, you may get something else that will speak specifically to you. And but if you are a teacher, you may get some bit of needed revelation that will help the peeps in your group. Matthew 7, 3, 5. For this illustration, the plank represents the log and the speck, the splinter. Same, same. But one more, as we can use the plank metaphor as a way to access to others who are in the same boat as us and or use it to be the first steps in building Christian relationships or as a way to cross over pitfalls, trials, and temptations by walking over them and or by entering into a discipleship relationship. Okay, so two more examples as I really want you to get in on the revealed mysteries. So we have in Genesis the following. Genesis 2.18, And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Then we have in Psalms the following. Psalms 2.8, Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance, and the ends of the earth for your possession. Some feedback so that you understand the context of this psalm. This is God the Father asking Jesus before he was born on earth, John 1, 14, what he wanted. Now, interpretation could lead us all over the place and totally outside of the Bible. But the revelation lines up because we have a scripture that supports the asking as well as the purpose. But now the question is, what did Jesus want while he was in heaven? By the way, he was a Lord or word in this conversation. Here is a revelation. He wanted a bride and church. It is not good that man should be alone, and Jesus was a man, and so I believe he had asked for a bride and for the church. Whether he knew the price, I could but suggest that he did because up there he was not bound by the limits of time. 
And even when he was down here at the age of 12, did he not tell his mother that he should be about his father's business? Luke 2, 49. Okay, so the next one also uses Genesis to start with and then waits to fulfill it in Revelation during the crucifixion. Genesis 2, 21, 23. And the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Now, what could this also be saying about Jesus and his bride and his church? By the way, not one in the same thing. The church is different than the bride. Well, let's go to the New Testament and see what's hanging around. John 19, 32, 37. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with the spear and immediately blood and water came out. And he who has seen has testified, and this testimony is true. And we know that he is telling the truth, so that you may believe. For these things were done that the scriptures should be fulfilled. Not one of his bones shall be broken. And again, another scripture says, they shall look on him whom they pierced. Before I get to the revelation, I want to also show you how prophecy gets fulfilled, which is also something we should be paying attention to in these days, as it will reflect that we are watching and waiting for his return. And but also that we are paying attention to the signs of the times. Luke twenty one thirty four. Zechariah twelve ten. And I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son, and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. So when Jesus states they will look upon me, yes, he knew what he was going to be up against before he was born because Zechariah is in the Old Testament, right? Okay, so just one more to clearly demonstrate that he was aware. Zechariah 13, 6. And one will say to him, What are these wounds between your arms? Then he will answer, Those which I was wounded in the house of my friends. Let us not make any bones about this next prophesy coming true. Psalms thirty four twenty. He guards all his bones. Not one of them is broken. Okay, so are you excited to hear the revelation of John 19, 32, 37, specifically verse 34? But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. Okay, so when this piercing happened, it represented the same ribbing Adam had received out of the garden from God. God took a rib from Adam, and ta-da, Eve was bornified. For real, I couldn't resist. And I say that when Jesus was pierced between his ribs, none broken, see? that his bride was born as was his church. You see, he had to die, or sleep rather, to receive her. And like Eve coming from Adam's side, Jesus' bride and church came from his side, so to speak. His shed blood made and is making her ready, and his death ensured he would receive a suitable helper. Additionally, does not blood and water represent a natural birth? Okay, so let's plank over to the first Bible reading, Tipitola. What does it say? One of seven. Well, we made it to our first point, so let's try a scripture for practice. Ephesians two fourteen seventeen. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one, and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, therefore putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and to those who were near. (laughs) So no, this is not how we do it. And I did this on purpose so as to make a point. I did go from period to period, assuming that it represented a clear thought. And were we not taught to read the whole sentence in school? And have we ever stopped reading any book, leaving off in the middle of a sentence? Well, Ephesians is known as the book of maturity. And so all this means is that it contains some hard stuff. Even Peter had his noodle a bit spun out with some of what Paul wrote, 2 Peter 3.16, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of the scriptures. So what we want to do first is remember to put everything in context. So, for example, a sentence or word misapplied in use may result in an error. In other words, get the whole story. This is why you are reading cover to cover. 
If you have any questions, write them down and get to them in your next round. You might have hundreds of questions to look up, which would make for a great study the next go around. And but as you go again, you would but have a general idea of the whole Bible, which could reduce misapplication as you continue to learn and grow. Let's give this another shot. Ephesians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus. So in this first step, we are asking ourselves, what does it say? It says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Jesus Christ. Now, this step might be silly, but it actually is not. It is teaching you to be precise in your reading. What does it say? I watch so many YouTube shorts where people are challenging the Christian preacher man who's putting it all on the line and misquoting the Bible to the embarrassment of themselves as they attempt to be the hero rescuer, pretending that they are rescuing the sinner from the gospel. I know it is wrong, and it's just that they don't know what they are talking about. This is a problem with only hearing a sermon every now and again and or signing up for a scripture day text. It is not enough spiritual food. And the proof is in the significant Christian ignorance of the Bible that supports this claim. And so, yes, they then have the unction to get mad at DMC and accuse them of setting them up. Listen, no smart man can cause you to stumble in the things of the Word of God, if indeed you have the Word of God in you. So, yes, if you were just to read cover to cover in step one, you could blow right through the Bible in a couple of months and be ready to go deeper the next round. And no, we are not doing this so that you can go and challenge the street preacher Now, I'm not asking that you jump on this three-month reading plan, but so you know, it is an option that doesn't come with any penalties. Sometimes we skip rocks on top of the water, and other times we drop one to the bottom of the lake. Tipitola 2, what does it mean? Two of seven. Paul is crediting God for bringing him before the saints in Ephesus. He is also stating his purpose, which is to be standing before and writing specifically to the saints in Ephesus. He is also stating that they are faithful which is establishing a platform in which he can speak to them with their understanding. He is also declaring that they are teachable and that they can receive revelation. If your explanation is shorter, great. I tend to be long-winded and overly specific. Tipitola 3, what does it mean to me? 3 of 7. In this step, I will caution you, at least in your first reading, as I stated earlier. I am assuming my listening audience to have never read through the Bible, that you try not to go too deep and stay away from commentaries in this round. You can keep notes if you have anything that you want to document in this step. For me, it shows that Paul considered that the church of Ephesus was under his shepherding and that they were responding and growing as he addressed them as faithful. Paul is not one to freely or casually throw around compliments just because. Uh, I almost went beyond it right there. He also addressed them as saints, which debunks Catholicism tradition of selecting certain people in whom they think are saints or eligible for sainthood. That practice is not in the Bible. So now I have a clear understanding of how the Bible identifies me. I am a faithful saint of God. If you are authentically born again, you are a saint of God. Before you do one thing for him, you are a saint of God. Tipitola 4. What should I believe? 4 of 7. The entire Bible and anything that people say that lines up with the Bible. Here are some other options, and yes, I will have to include other scriptures, more than you need, but also enough to make the point. Matthew eighteen sixteen. But if he will not hear, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. Proverbs eleven fourteen. Where there is no counsel, the people fall, but in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. Proverbs fifteen twenty two. Without counsel, plans go awry, but in the multitude of counselors. They are established. Proverbs 24, 6. For by wise counsel you will wage your own war. And in a multitude of counselors, there is safety. In your first round, really just stick to the reading and writing down any questions for the next round. When I first got going, I really learned to slow down on going to just anyone to seek Bible knowledge and revelation. I guessed at that time and assumed that if you were a Christian longer than I, then you would be more knowledgeable. In this, I would just advise caution and learn to initially depend on God. Once you are able to discern by wisdom a person's spiritual standing in God, as well as to be able to test their spirit, then you can begin to engage with that person. I'm not advocating that you become a loner Christian, but ensuring that you are careful about whom you seek help from. Learn from my experiences. Point. Believe that you currently understand that the Bible is saying to you and believing in any prophetic words or words of knowledge you might receive. 
If the Bible cannot support it, then throw it out. God has a way of relocating it if it is just not understood by you at that time. Tipitola 5. What should I stop believing? 5 of 7. You should stop believing everything that does not flow with the scripture stories. I say it that way in the face of these two scriptures that John wrote. John 20, 30, 31. And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. John 21, 25. And there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Amen. But now we have to be careful here because there are false teachers, false prophets, false apostles, and false Christs. And but now I believe in your sincere searching out the scriptures that God will keep you from making all the mistakes you could have made in your journey as you get to know him. You will make mistakes. Yes, but this is how you are trained to depend upon him and to rely on faith. The activity of your faith is what distinguishes you from all other religions. We believe in what we cannot see. Don't tell your doctor that bit of information. You're likely to get an opportunity to read your Bible 40 times in six months. I remember someone telling me as I was sharing the gospel that God helps those who help themselves. And so, but I took it as scripture because it sounded true. I mean, I have decisions to make in my relationship with God, right? This was a lie from the enemy, which was designed to get me into self-reliance. It was a God relationship and dependability in him killer. Without him, I am nothing. If you don't believe that now about yourself, you will after you cover to cover. Tipitola 6. What should I do? 6 of 7. Simple enough, right? You do what it states when you are able to do so. This is where your prayer list can also be developed. 2 Thessalonians 5.17. God, please equip me to preach the gospel in power so that I can fulfill the Great Commission. Mark 16.15.20. Make a list of dues, but also seek to discover what calling you might have. Ephesians 4, 11, 16. He gives you the desires of your heart. Psalms 37, 4. Find out what gifts you might be functioning in. 1 Corinthians 12, 1 through 31. Oh, there are many dues, but you want to be sure you are doing the dues designed for you to do. <laughs> and tip of 7. What should I stop doing? 7 of 7. Sin. What? Yes, well, it's an oversimplification, but a true statement nonetheless. There are other things such as stop hanging out with your unbelieving friends, stop doing the things that harm your health, such as smoking cigs or cigars, drinking too much, stop sexing with anyone, even your current girlfriend or boyfriend. Like I said, work on stopping to sin. God has an abundance of grace and mercy and can, through a freeing process, break off every chain that binds you. Freedom from sinning is one of the many benefits of salvation. Romans 6, 18, and 22. Now, before I move on to the next four points, you should know that in each of these tipitolas, I could write a book. I only wanted to get you started. The Holy Spirit is a good teacher and will teach you all that you need to know as you learn to respond to his voice. Now, in the process of reading and studying, you want to be looking for four things. I put these at the end of this message, as I do not recommend that you try to discover all of these things as you are just getting started. Yes, of course, if you are along well in reading your Bible, more than the average Christian peep, then you can give it a go. I do not in any way want to restrict anyone's potential rate of growth. Who is he that is God? One of four. Now, this is more than just finding out the names of God. You want to focus on who he is to you as you enter into a relationship with him. He is a relational God and has done an enormous amount of things to set up his plan in order that you might want to get to know him. This is a primary reason for reading your Bible. Now, but if you come up with a version of a different God than the one in the Bible, then you got sideways somewhere. You can have a very intimate relationship with the God of the Bible without going outside of it. William Branham and Smith Wigglesworth are just two people that you can read about if you want to learn more about the value of getting to know God. And but it isn't just so that you can do magic tricks. You can cast out demons and heal the sick until there are no more demons and no more sickness and disease. And but if you did not know God as a priority over and above the magic tricks, then you are not going to heaven. Matthew seven twenty one twenty three. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. And isn't it interesting here what Jesus says? But he who does the will of my Father. These people were doing things 
using the gifts that the Holy Spirit actually gave us to use. The difference was they were using it for their own benefit, for their own glory. They were not doing it at the time and season when God the Father was commanding that they do it. This is how they got sideways. Oh, they still look like Christians because all the magic tricks are following them, but they did not have God's heart. Who is he to me? To a four. Now, this step will take some time. But as you get to know God with the intention of hearing him and seeing him, then your relationship will go deep. John 5, 19, 20 and 12, 50. I would say that as you do this, your group of people, that is those at your current level, will shrink down considerably. You will know this when you start to share some revelation that they do not yet have a spiritual slot to understand. A.W. Tozer explains this in his writings. Now, but this does not mean that we are better or even more spiritual than they. But you do want to guard your heart. Philippians 4, 7 and Proverbs 4, 23. We love our brothers no matter where they are at. If Jesus could hang out with the likes of you and me, then you can hang out with the likes of anyone. Just keep silent on the things they may not yet have the revelation for. Jesus stated this on that. John sixteen twelve. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. How should I do what I should do? Three of four. Once you start to find out what you should do, which is often best discovered when you are learning and doing at the same time. James 2.18 But someone will say, You have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You will have hits and misses, but the more you get into the Bible and learn to serve, the faster the discovery of your purpose and calling. Now, if it takes 25 years, as in my case, to be released into the larger bit of your calling, then great, be patient. But in the process of preparing, serve in the church. Try all the different positions until one fits like a glove. It may fit for a season or for a lifetime. That is between you and God. When should I do it? Four of four. Okay, so I've seen the building up of a church only to see it totally collapse later. Why? Because we were releasing spiritual babies into a ministry that they were not yet ready to handle. Look, some positions are defined as to what we should do when filling them. 1 Timothy 3.10 But let these also first be tested, then let them serve as deacons, being found blameless. Others are not so defined. Now, without going into the equipping or discipling or gifting or purpose and calling or anything else that you should be going through, your release date in the ministry should not take too many years to get or got. The Holy Spirit will use people to offer up opportunities for you to serve. Get or done as those offers come. At least you add time to your equipping. 2 Corinthians 5, 18, 19. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Everyone has a ministry as you preach the gospel, as everyone is also a preacher. Then you are working in the reconciliation capacity. Entering into this level of ministry should not take you that long. From this, you may be sent to be an evangelist or pastor or apostle or prophet, and yes, even a teacher. Perhaps you have the gift of administration or helps or service. Hospitality could be your number, so open up your home and work that gift. However God has put you together, there is a place for you to fit in, so to speak. The when will come, sometimes from God or a church member or through an open or closed door. You will learn to read times and seasons. Okay, so in closing, I recommend that if you have a church, then get to serving. It is up to you and not your church to find a place where you can serve the Lord. I once heard that only about 10% of the people attending the church are actually doing something in the church to help. Even if it is 50%, it is insufficient. What if after we enter a war, half the soldiers say that they are no longer interested in fighting? Well, as extreme as that sounds, it is the same thing in the church. We are in a battle and we are soldiers. And but the worser thing about not serving as a Christian is when you stand before Jesus and he asks an accounting of the work you did for him, 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 while you were on this earth. Don't imagine what that will feel like as it might just kill you on the spot. Well, I was going to leave it there and decided it was too gloomy. And why should I give the lazies the last word? I truly am serious about doing whatever I can to convince you that you need to read your Bible. Living a Christian life by trying to guess what God has assigned for you to do is spiritually classified as illegal gambling. Yes, it is spiritually gambling with your very salvation. You are more than a conqueror in Christ, doing Christ's things. 
Go pray for someone's healing. Give them a word of knowledge. If you don't know how to do these things, then watch YouTube videos of where churches are doing this. Rinse and repeat what you see. I'm totally open to hearing about any of your testimonies. Podcast preacher at AppliedStrengthsMinistry.com And if you don't have a church, I recommend going to my website and clicking on Rev Church or Elijah Ministries, Fire and Glory. Those ministries are online and live anytime for you to watch. You can get the schedule on their sites. Well, that's it for today. Remember, it's not what you find wrong or disagree with regarding these messages, but what you can take away from them. Together, we can do more to impact the kingdom than if we work alone. Let's flip the script and kill, steal, and destroy the works of the enemy and create space for the light of life to shine through in people's lives. Plan a seed and click on the like and subscribe button. In doing so, you will be ministering. <laughs> Let's build this ministry together, yours and mine. Thanks and see you next time in Deep Waters.